Yo, buddy. What's going on? Hey, it's video. I am Jimmy Kemsky from phillyvoice.com. That guy, eh, Brandon Lee Galton, fleetinggreennation.com. This is BGN Radio episode number 381. Uh, our post-Super Bowl podcast, we're going to talk more about Hassan Reddick and the trade rumors associated with him. Get to some of the Super Bowl stuff between the Chiefs and the hated 49ers. And we'll talk about some of the uh, coaching hires that the Eagles have made over the last week or two. And also some of the coaches that, I don't want to say lost, but have found employment elsewhere uh, in the NFL who are with the Eagles in 2023. But before we get to all that, if you are a beer drinker and you're over 21 years old, go to wrongcrowdbeer.com in Westchester, PA. Uh, Wrong Crowd Brewing Company there. You can order from them online at wrongcrowdbeer.com. Uh, actually, uh, Dan, the owner, just dropped off a big bundle of beer to Brandon. Uh, what, this past weekend, I think it was? Friday. Saturday? Shout out to Dan. Friday? Okay. So I got to get over there and get my share before yeah, I Brandon drink it hogs all. it all. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's going to be... Our, Brandon's fridge is probably filled up with beer. Mine soon will be delicious. Wrong crowd beer. What did, what did he drop off again? What, what well, other Jimmy, let's uh, let's just show the people here. I have a oh, wrong yeah, crowd <laughs> beer. So this is new. They have a seltzer too, which oh, Jimmy, this, right. I swear to you, I am not being like hyperbolic because it's a sponsor, which it is a sponsor. So I have to be anyway, even if I didn't, but I do mm -hmm. believe this. I opened a can of this when I got it on Friday because I was very intrigued by the wrong crowd beer, orange seltzer. And even just like before even taking a taste, just getting like a little bit of a sniff, it <laughs> smells like an orange, like like an actual okay. orange. Not like I was expecting just because every other kind of seltzer or whatever I've had in my life, you know, how it kind of has like that artificial flavor taste. You know, uh -huh. like it's not, it doesn't taste like the actual fruit. It tastes like that flavor of you know like a fruit candy or you know that artificially kind of flavor which you know makes sense it's not an actual thing but this smells and actually tastes like an orange and it's funny because i brought a, uh, some cans over this over to my friend elizabeth's house when i was watching the super bowl with her and uh i had that opinion and i was i was excited to tell her about it but i didn't want to uh, you know, influence her genuine take on it. Right. So I was like, here, try it and let me think of it. Let me see. Let, let's hear what you think of it. Give me your honest feedback. And she said the same thing. And I was like, okay, so it's not just me. It actually like really smells and tastes like a fresh orange, not that artificial flavor. So I highly recommend the wrong crowd beer seltzer or in seltzer. If you can get your hands, I'm going to save those for the summer. I think for beach great time. summer drink. Yeah. All right. Hassan Reddick. Uh, Sources per Ian Rappaport. I'll just read this. Eagles All-Pro edge rusher Hassan Reddick has received permission to seek a trade following another disruptive season featuring double-digit sacks. 29-year-old with 27 sacks over the last two seasons in Philly. Could land elsewhere. So I'd sort of covered this in um, a recent mailbag. Uh because it was, I was basically just kind of doing like a, a 60,000 foot view of the Eagle salary cap and things that they're going to have to do one way or the other with certain, like they're going to cut Kevin Byard obviously uh, and save like 13 million on him. They're going to have to do something with Avante Maddox's contract because they're not going to keep him at that number, whether he's cut or takes a pay cut or whatever they do with that. And then there's certainly going to do something with Hassan Reddick's contract because he's got a cap number of 22 million in 2024 and he's got uh, a salary of 14 million, I think. I should have probably been prepared with that number before we started the podcast. <laughs> but uh, anyway, one way or the other, they're going to have to do something with it, whether they convert uh, that base salary into a signing bonus and then, you know, kind of kick the can down the road, stretch it out over the next few years, uh, whether they sign him to a contract extension and pull that base salary down to something really minimal. Um, that's another way that you can save money or if they trade them. So I didn't think the trading was totally off the table. And then sure enough, this trade talk begins now, uh, before we started this podcast, like an hour before it, we're recording this at two, it's right now, 2 PM, uh, on what's today, Tuesday, uh, about an hour Tuesday, ago, February 13th, there was a report from Jordan Schultz 
who, by the way, did you know his dad is the CEO of Starbucks? <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, he reported that he talked to Reddick. Reddick is claiming that he never said, I want to be traded. He said he wants to sign a contract extension uh, with the Eagles and would, you know, he grew up here. He grew up in Camden. We know wants to stay in the area, wants to play for the Eagles. He's an Eagles fan growing up and doesn't want to be traded. So there's some probably gray area there. Like there's no doubt that Hassan Reddick has massively outproduced his contract that he signed with the Eagles two years ago. Um, as Rappaport noted, he's got uh, what 27 sacks over the last two years. As you, as you have noted, Brandon, repeatedly, like he, I think he was in the top three sacks in the NFL since uh, 2020. He's now fourth, I he's, think. I think what was it? Trey Hendrickson fourth. passed him, yeah. so he's mm-hmm. fourth now uh, in sacks since the you know 2020. That's I mean, he seasons. was the best defender in the. He was the best. Like if you include the playoffs last year, 2022 best defender in the NFL. Like he like if the if you included the playoffs in NFL defensive player of the year voting, he probably wins because he like totally went off at the end of the season last year and then obviously the big um you know two games in the playoffs before the Super Bowl uh that got the Eagles to to the Super Bowl. Um so just you know an elite edge rusher numbers are down in 2023 only 11 sacks only one forced fumble. So I think that he was a rare player that generated pressure down the stretch for the Eagles, even though he like his numbers weren't there at the end of the year, but he was consistently generating pressure. Whereas the rest of the pass rush kind of went invisible. And then also when they made the switch from Sean Desai to Matt Patricia, opposing offenses were just easily figuring out ways to shift pre-snap and get Reddick into a position where he's dropping into coverage instead of rushing the passer. So a lot of things were working right. against him this year in terms of putting up the same kind of numbers this year that, as, that, that he did last year. Uh, but he's going to be 30, you know, had, he's going to turn 30 during the 2024 season. I think in September his birthday is. So, you know, you got to be careful about keeping guys longer than their lifespan, but he's certainly a player that's in his prime and, um, you know, it's, he's, like I said, he's been one of the best edge rushers in the NFL, which is obviously a very, very valuable thing to have if you're trying to build an NFL roster. Yeah, I mean, I think what happened here is that Hassan Reddick and the Eagles were talking potential contract extension, considering he's going into the final year of his deal. And this is something that's been on everyone's radar dating back to he didn't show up to OTAs last year, which is fine because they're voluntary at the same time. He's from Camden. Like it's not like he's like in California where he lives. You know, he's like from the area. So you would think he'd be there if he really wanted to be. And it's fine. He didn't show up. He didn't miss any of the mandatory time. But in training camp, he was asked about, you know, like how is he point hit? blank? Was are you underpaid? Is is what he was asked. It, like he was like those three you see words. It? Yeah. yeah. He was asked and he's like, Well, you see it. Way, I I forgot to note, by the way, and sorry to, to cut you off, but he's the six right now, he's the sixteenth highest paid edge rusher. In yep. the NFL, on average annual value basis, when he was asked that question, I believe he was fifteenth. So he's and been also you know, he's obviously way underpaid. And it's not even just the rankings; it's the gap too. Like he's way under, you know, where right. the likes of uh, Miles Garrett and TJ Watt, like those guys, are making like over ten more a year yeah. than him. Like that's a big gap. And then Trey Hendrickson, I think, is like tenth around there. It, Nick so, Bosa is making like thirty three, I think, and he's making fifteen. Right. So there's, think, a, there's a guy making more than double him. I think at the very least, Reddick would like to be top 10. I think that's like, you know, that's where negotiation, that's where the like things start. It's obviously, I think he wants to be higher than that. But I think at the very least, it's like that that has to be the starting point. Um, and he wants to go up from there. Uh, and so I think that he obviously should value himself a lot. And he, I think he has leverage too. I mean, we get into this. You look at what the Eagles have behind him. Mm-hmm. Not really much. If you don't have him here. And in a time, too, where they're trying to win now, this isn't like a reset. You, Nick Sirianni's on the hot seat. Like, he has to win now. Yeah. Uh, the Eagles clearly feel like it wasn't just talent that was the big issue. They felt like coaching was the big issue, hence the changes they made. So uh, it just doesn't really make sense that you'd be trying to offload them, which I don't think they are trying to do. And I don't think Hassan Reddick wants out. It's just going back to what I was originally saying, a matter of they're probably talking contract extension at some level, and there's a big gap between what the Eagles are willing to pay him and what Hassan Reddick thinks he deserves. 
Therefore, mm-hmm. it then makes sense for the Eagles to say, hey, let's let you talk, or at least your agent, more likely, not him directly, but your agent, go talk to other teams, see what you can kind of maybe get what's out there, get a, get a mm-hmm. feel for what these offers are, and you know, come back to us with them. Let us know like what other teams are willing to pay Hassan, and we can talk from there. Then we can kind of progress in these contract negotiations. That's kind of what they did with Darius Slay last year. Um, you know, they they gave him permission, they gave him an ability to kind of seek uh, <clears throat> other opportunities. He, it almost happened. There was reporting. He, I think, he even said that it almost happened that um, he would have gone to the Ravens. Obviously, didn't in the end. The Eagles ended up keeping him. I think that's what might happen with Hassan Radek here. I think he might talk to other teams, and the number that they might be willing to pay could be higher than what the Eagles are thinking. So maybe they mm-hmm. kind of compromise there. I just think that again. <clears throat> You can't tra- – I think here's – maybe this is too, giving the Eagles too much credit. Uh, I think whatever happens is going to be the right move in terms of I don't think the Eagles are going to trade him unless they get such a good offer that it's obvious you have to trade him. Right. Or I think the Eagles are going to sign him to an extension that is a reasonable deal and fair to both him and the team. So I think it's going to work out, and I ultimately – I guess I lean towards him staying because, I, again, I do think he wants to be here, and they don't have a great – backup plan behind him because if you get rid of him you need to do something else you can't just be like well we're just gonna ride with what we have like you have to then go to a new plan and if you're not willing to pay Hassan Reddick well now you're willing to pay someone else so uh I think they should be very hesitant to move on from Hassan Reddick quickly I don't think that's what they're trying to do but uh I would lean towards them they should try to keep him here I think another comp an even better one uh, than Slay is Zach Ertz when they were, you know, potentially dealing him. They essentially let Ertz do the same thing. Ultimately what happened there when they're initially trying to trade him, not trying to trade him, but they let him go seek a trade. They didn't find good enough. They didn't like nobody, nobody was willing to give up enough to trade for Zach Ertz. <laughs> and like Zach Ertz even acknowledged like, yeah, I understand they have to get like their fair, like a, a reasonable deal in return to, to trade me. And he understood that. Mm-hmm. And I, my, my guess is that he also didn't find a lot of teams like willing to give him more money than he was making at the time. I'm guessing that's also what happened there. Um, and eventually a deal get did get done with Ertz, but that was during the, you know, the 2021 season when they were already looking like they probably weren't going to make the playoffs that year. Obviously they did, right? but they were, you know, there were sellers. Was, yeah. There was clearly sellers at that point. Um, but as you mentioned too, like I think edge rusher was a position that before the start of the 2023 season, it seemed like the Eagles were really deep and talented there. And then what we saw was regression from everyone. So Reddick went from 16 sacks and I think f- f- five or six force fumbles in 2022. And then he had 11 and one, like I, like I mentioned earlier, Josh sweat down year, man, like 6.5 sacks. He was like, that's a guy who like, in my opinion, was kind of turning into like a star player and then fizzled, didn't have a sack. And like, wh- how many games was it at the end of the year? Straight. He had, or- he had one in the playoff game. So he ultimately finished with one sack in two TFLs in his last eight games. Yeah. So, right. He, I think his last sack was the big one that he had at the end of the Cowboys game that the Eagles won that basically sealed that game. Brandon Graham, 11 sacks in 2022. Only had three in 2023 and, you know, he wants to come back, but that's not a guy that you're relying on at this point. That's a guy that like you you only bring back because you like what he does in the locker room and you like, you know, he's a guy that can come in and give you like some snaps here and there, but you're not like asking you should be your fourth defensive end, maybe be a playmaker at this point. And then Nolan Smith, you know, obviously drafted in the first round, barely played 200 snaps as a rookie. And, you know, part of that is because, they didn't want to take Hassan Reddick and Josh Sweat off the field. And and I get that, but I think one of the big mistakes that the Eagles made this year was not playing their rookies early, get like getting them involved in some way. And Nolan Smith, I think, is an example of that. But also when Nolan Smith played, he rarely made an impact. Like he, you know, you know, a good play here and there. But and you know, part of that probably is because he wasn't playing. Like you can't get right. better unless you're out there. So I think they made a mistake with him. You know, jury's out on, you know, what kind of player he'll become. 
uh, you know, it would have been nice to have seen more of him as a rookie. So we have a better idea, but it's an unknown. So if you do trade Hassan Reddick and you're asking Nolan Smith to take on a way bigger role that he may or may not be ready for. And I just don't think you can do that. I mean, you have to play him. He should be, have a bigger role, but you can't just be like, well, we don't need Hassan Reddick because we have Nolan Smith. Like, obviously you can't just say that. It's like, there's a big gap. Even if, even if Nolan Smith does great this year, even if he like outperforms expectations by a ton, there's still be again, a big gap between that, who that is. And then who Hassan Reddick is and what he gives to this team. The Reddick thing, he was actually on pace to have a more productive year than last year for a bit there until Mm -hmm. the defense started to collapse. And that's with him coming into the season with that thumb injury that he had to play a cast uh, on with cast on for, for like what, three games or so there, three or four games. Yeah. Once it came off, he started playing better. So like, I don't really buy that. I I think if the defense didn't fall apart as a whole, I think he would have kind of kept on that pace and had potentially an even better or very similar year to last year. So, and also, because he, this kind of applies to Brandon Graham too. He didn't play a lot of snaps earlier in his career because he, you know, wasn't like this player who was an every down player for the Cardinals because he didn't like have a role. He you was know, playing off ball linebacker. He yeah. wasn't, he wasn't who his son Reddick came to be. So it wasn't like, he, my point is, I think he has more tread on the tires than your average player of his age. And I think Edge Rusher is like, it's just durable too. He didn't miss any games with the Eagles. Knock on wood. Yeah. And also, I think Edge Rushers generally can play longer. I mean, Look at look at Brandon Graham, just for example, as opposed to cornerbacks. Like that's a position where you see the drop off a little bit more steep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I just don't really think they should be as hesitant to pay him. I don't think, like, I just think they can get. I think they could maybe get a four year deal done with him, and that's only like three years of commitment. And you feel really good about this year, and there's two years after that you figure it out. Um, and maybe some of that is a cost of trying to win now, and maybe taking a worse deal on the back end. I just, I, I, to me, Hassan Reddick like, has to be on this team next year, unless you're just getting blown away. Unless it's an offer that's just like, oh yeah, of course we had to take that offer because it was just a, a no brainer. And I feel like at that point you're you're talking about. So let's talk into the value. Like, what what do you trade Hassan Reddick for? What's he worth? I think it has to be at least a two. I think it has to be more than that. I would certainly think that, and this is rare. And I guess and hard to project, but a player for especially if you're trying to win now, a player has a lot of value. A, a player, a different position, can help this team now. Although that kind of feels weird because what player is more valuable than the position that he plays? So, uh, what do you think the Eagles could get in return for Hassan Reddick? Or what could you think? What do you think they could get, and what would you think is acceptable? Yeah. So let me take a step back real quick before I answer that. But like you mentioned, you know his value or whatever. You think back to like what they had before him. And one of the, like my, one of my favorite sort of like things to compare during their 2022 season. And even in 2020, I guess not in 2021, but during the 2022 season, it was like, okay, where was the bigger upgrade from? I know what you're going to say <laughs> Jalen Rager to AJ Brown or from Jannard Avery to Hassan Reddick. And I think it's kind of close. Like I'd probably say Rager to AJ Brown, uh. but it's, but it's like, it's a debate at least. And when you think about like what their pass rush was before Hassan Reddick got there, it's a big difference. And yeah. you know, it's valuable. Like he's a very valuable player. And I think he actually, the, the Eagles actually probably will get some kind of decent offer for him. You look at like the trade deadline, by the way, like during the season, the commanders traded Chase Young, but got very little for him. They got a, basically a third round comp pick for the 49ers. But I think the one that the, the other trade that is probably the better comp is, and it's not perfect. Like they're these players are a little different, but Montez Sweat, who the commanders traded to the Bears for uh, a two, it's going to be a high two. Bears mm-hmm. won a bunch of games down the stretch. So they're, that two wound up not being quite as great. But at the time, like that was a team that was like dead in the water, and still they traded for at the deadline for for like actually like they did a year ago with Chase Claypool, right. weird organization. But they traded for Montez Sweat, who was like uh, you know in the final year of his deal, and that was a two. And they also then paid him a contract that was I think it's twenty four and a half million per year, mm-hmm. making making Montez Sweat I think like the the fifth or sixth uh, highest paid edge rusher. In the NFL, now their age is a little different. Reddick's two years older than Sweat, which, you know, not a huge difference there. Uh, Sweat is a lot bigger. Like, he's a different kind of body type, different kind of player. He's 6'6", 2, like 60. 
Whereas, you know, Redick is kind of a smaller guy that just wins with speed. Um, but the production you know, is also a lot different. The production is also a lot different in that Redick has. So Sweat actually had a better 2023 just numbers wise. But overall, like last four years, it is yeah. night and day. Like Hassan Redick is a far, far more productive player than Montez. Sweat. And by the way, like Montez Sweat had, I think, like seven sacks with the Bears after that trade. So at the time the trade was made, like Reddick probably had better production than Sweat did at the time. So, yeah. but anyway, you know, clearly Reddick has, you know, has, has been a bigger producer uh, in the NFL, at least over the last four or five years than Montez Sweat. So I think that's kind of the better comparison. If somebody offered, like if I'm the Eagles and somebody offered me a high two, low one, I'd do well, it. Yeah, I think a one is, you know, then you're you're cooking for sure. And I don't know if a team would do that. I think a team, late one, you're obviously you could look at a, a late one, a team. Yeah, you're looking at a like, contender in that case, you know. That's what I mean, though. But then, okay, yeah, but then you're, you're giving the, a contender like a really nice piece, which makes yeah, it harder I mean, for well, you to win a, the championship. If it's an AFC team, who cares? If it's an <laughs> AFC know? team, for sure, that does help. But like, yeah, I'm not. I don't. But I don't want to trade them to like in conference to a team that you're competing with the one seed for. Like, let's let's say the Bills are they're done with Von Miller, okay? Right. And they they offered you their mm-hmm. one for Hassan Reddick. I'm doing that in a half a heartbeat. Yeah, I think you have to take that, especially too if you're just so far apart on the contract number and what that's look like moving forward. Um, yeah, and and it, he's getting a deal that you know looks like kind of wild. Like if if you're trading him, he's also getting like a relatively not too crazy deal, and that's tough. But uh, yeah, I think I don't think a one is in play though. I don't. I, I don't unless, either. Yeah, to, unless to be it's clear, like I don't either. Conditional in some way, um, that could be possible. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's at least a two because also just from and I know you know you're the comp pick master, and it legals might not be even in play for comp picks down the road when this would be uh, applicable after the season when Asad Reddick is done with his deal after the 2024 season. But in theory, if Hassan Reddick goes to the market and gets a big deal like Javon Hargrave did, uh, then he could potentially get you a third round comp pick right. or maybe a fourth, depending again on what the contract is. So I just don't like, I don't think a three is enough. And I just don't think that moves the needle. I think it has to be a two and it has to, again, like you said, I think it has to be a good two. It can't be like a late two. It yeah. You, I think you, if like, somebody offers you a three, you laugh at him and you hang up. <laughs> you know, like yeah. This is not realistic. But like a, a yeah, I think a high two, I'd really have to strongly consider it. Uh, low two, probably not doing it. I think it has to be at that point. It had to be plus. You know, you're looking at like low two plus something plus a four mm-hmm. or I don't know something else. It has to be there has to be more into that. Or a well, you player. look at like so the Von Miller trade. By the way, that when when the Bills traded was it the Bill? I've, I've, he's been he's kind of bounced around a little bit, but the, well, he got the, traded he was at on one the point. Broncos. For, the Rams but, traded for him in season. Oh, okay, yeah. I and think then, that was for a two. Okay, so when the Rams traded him, it was for a two and a three, mm-hmm. and that was at a point where he right. like the previous season he had missed the entire previous season with I don't remember if it was an ACL or Achilles, but it was some kind of you know bad injury, and then he wasn't super productive in the first half of that year. He still they, they got a two and a three for Von Miller at that point. Von but Miller's also with the deadline name. where they're trying to like push their chips in. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Um, Again, like there could be a team that's bigger. That's I mean, you don't necessarily have to wait until the trade the trade deadline to push your chips in. You can do it, right? You know, you can start to do that in February and March or whatever. Um, so it's possible that you know some team looks at this as an opportunity that they don't want to miss out on. They they just love him as a player. They make a, an offer that the Eagles can't refuse. So I wouldn't totally dismiss the idea of the Eagles trading him, but uh, it is interesting that like. <laughs> You know, now that Reddick has come out and said, I didn't ask for a trade, you, mm-hmm. we now know where that came from. Like, we, we know we know where that report now came, it came from the Eagles. Like, right. <laughs> that, that they, it seems that like they the Eagles want to, they wanted it out there. They wanted teams to know that he was available. So, I think there, there's some motivation there to, to get something in return for him. I think the Eagles are kind of, or Howie's kind of like playing Madden here. He's like, this is a this is a valuable asset. And, and to be fair to Howie, he has a pretty good read on that Smart, stuff usually. Sure. So he probably, I would think, it has some kind of sense there could be this market out there for Hassan Reddick where he's just, you know, looking at the value ultimately. And I think it is possible, again, that it exists where you can the return you can get is actually worth more than Hassan Reddick is, but that has to be a high price. And again, it comes back to that's fine. You can make like that move in a vacuum is good when you assess that on paper. 
But then you have to add the context of what the Eagles have an edge rusher behind that and what your plan yeah. is there. And right. if you don't have a plan there or things fall through, then it is suddenly, even though the, the value of the deal might be correct, but the context of the situation might not be. So I think it's kind of a, an interesting spot for them. It, it I'm makes gonna sense guess. to do it now too, by the way. It makes sense to, for them to figure out if they're going to make a trade now because then they can formulate their offseason plan accordingly, right. like knowing that they exactly. have to find an edge ed rusher help. I'm going to guess that he stays. What do you think? Just, you know, let's go on the record. Why not? I'll go the opposite. I'll say he's traded. Yeah. Okay. What do you think he goes for? Just general. So if it gets parameter. done, okay, well, why don't we set an over under? Why don't we set it at 39.5? And, and this, this only works if like there's no players involved. So if it's just draft pick capital alone, if the mm-hmm. value of the draft pick or picks, we'll use the, the trade value chart. Is it going to be better or worse than thirty nine point the thirty nine point fifth overall pick? And we'll for, and it, forget about forget about the year. We'll, we'll forget like what what year the picks are in. Yeah, right. Yeah, I I think that it would be a multi pick thing, which would complicate it. I think it would be like I don't think it's just well, one you can, pick. well we, we would add up the value of the picks and and use the chart. Like okay, yeah, uh, I'm going to say it would be better than that because I think it has to be. Yeah, I think it's going to be better than that too. Okay. Uh, why don't we take a break, Jimmy? We'll take a break. The it's interesting because for the video version with the NFC East mixtape, like we say we're going to take a break, but then we actually don't. We just keep the video version as is. But the audio feed, you know, Rachel inserts the ads for the audio. So I'm guessing if we do the same thing, you're just going to be on YouTube here and seeing us. Which, by the way, we should mention should, if you're not already watching this episode on YouTube, you can go to the Winning Your Nation YouTube channel and subscribe appreciate that so you can see our beautiful shining faces so we're actually if you're watching the video version not going to go anywhere but if you're listening to the audio version you're going to hear from us after you hear a message from our sponsors jimmy yes back after this back here on bgn radio which in addition to wrong crowd beer company as you can see here on the can Based in here's the address here in in Westchester, three forty two Hannah Mav. Boom, been there. Uh, yeah, that's right, multiple times. And it's also brought to you by, as you can see on my hat here, which you can get yourself, I believe, at righteousfelon dot com. Righteous Felon Craft Jerky. Get yourself some high quality meat snacks, delicious. My dad gets these a lot he's a big fan my mom orders them for him because she's loving and supportive and uh it's a great gift i think that he really enjoys he the spicy ones are a little much for him but i love them so it works out for me because he usually gives me those those are really good but uh multiple other great flavors of the beef jerky sticks in addition they obviously have other forms of traditional you know beef jerky in the bag and they have the Biltong, a lot of different flavors that you can try. I always say that if you happen to see Righteous Felon Craft Jerky in the wild, such as a, a giant supermarket, or soon coming to Wawa in April, try a pack. And then if you like it, buy in bulk so you can get more flavors. And also you can get a discount when you buy in bulk. So do it by going to RighteousFelon.com and using discount code BGN15 for 15% off your offer. That is, or off your order. That is like once again, RighteousFelon.com, discount code BGN15. Okay, Jimmy. Yes. The 49ers lost the Super Bowl. <laughs> that I'm so did. devastated. I'm so sad. Oh, no. <laughs> the 49ers lost. Oh, no. Uh, you got to feel for those, for that, uh, such a good group of guys. That, well, uh... wait. I just thought about <laughs> this. Um, They won their Super Bowl. They beat the Eagles in, in that's, December. That's true. That's they true. were they were very pumped about that in terms of like the reaction on their sideline. It mm-hmm. was very I've never seen a sideline. They, so all, they wore something. all black to that game. Like That's all the players right. were wearing all black. And they, I mean, and give them credit. I mean, they beat the living crap out of the Eagles. In that That's game. right. That was I their mean, championship before, before the game. They like walked right through the defensive back. Like That's uh, right. uh, their, like their, their position individual group. drills. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, that was a sign because the Eagles did nothing. Did yeah. nothing about that, and that's kind of how that day went from there. From there on out, the Eagles got punked badly that day, yeah. and uh, not just the Eagles. By the way, there are plenty of other players around the league that were like taking joy 
in mm. the 49ers loss in the Super Bowl. Aaron Donald, for example, like was showing yeah, off his sense. ring. Division What's rival. What's that? Yeah, that the means, division rival. Yeah. yeah. But still, there were like, I mean, there were other people too. I don't remember exactly who they were, but um, people were taking a special joy hmm. in watching the 49ers lose. And for good why. reason. They like they just they they ran their mouths the entire season. They played this whole well, first of all, they complained about the NFC championship game for the first you know, six, seven months, <laughs> you know, thereafter, which is ridiculous. And then uh and then they had this whole like us against the world underdog kind of mentality. They're favored in literally every single one of their games this year, favored in all they lost six games, by the way, even despite being favored in all of them. And mm. you know, they come into the Super Bowl. Having been outplayed, by the way, both in the divisional round uh, against yeah. the Packers, the seven seed Packers, and then I mean they should have lost uh, that game, and then they should have lost uh, to the Lions in the NFC Championship game. They're you know down what twenty four to seven, I think it was at halftime of that game, yep. and the Lions just just stopped making plays in the second half of that game, and also got like some weird like super lucky plays with the ball bouncing off of uh, uh, interesting. Uh, Kindle Vildor's face. Uh, and into the hands of Brandon Ayuk for like a 50 something yard play. But like, you know, not, not, you know, not this game said and done 49ers lost. Of course, this is now three 10 point leads that Kyle Shanahan has blown uh, in the Super Bowl two as a head coach, of course, four or five years ago, whatever it was in uh, Super Bowl 54. I think it was um, when again, he lost to the chiefs. And then uh, on Sunday, obviously he did it again. And then before that, even more infamously, the uh the 28 to 3 game between the Falcons uh and the Patriots when he was the Falcons offensive coordinator and i mean he got the lion's share of the blame for that too in the aftermath it wasn't it wasn't like Dan Quinn who got the blame for that who was the head coach of the Falcons it was Kyle Shanahan and the calls that he played offensively in the second half of that game they they basically he got most of the blame for that loss and you know he also blew a 10 point loss by the way but 10 point he also blew a 10 point lead by the way, in uh, the NFC Championship game in 2021 uh, against the Rams. The Rams came back and, and beat them uh, to go to the Super Bowl, in which they eventually won. So, man, like, <laughs> and he was like, in this game, he knew the overtime rules, but his players did not, which is freaking crazy to me. As the, I think the article was by Lindsey Jones of uh, The Ringer, who said that, I don't remember if this was Kyle Juszczyk or uh, somebody else, but they said that when regulation ended, they put the overtime rules up on the Jumbotron of Allegiant Stadium. And that was the first time 49ers players mm -hmm. had seen that. They, they didn't know that the rules were different in the playoffs than they were from the regular season. While the Chiefs were, you know, they they had been schooled on overtime rule changes, like since like training camp. Um, not that they went over it the entirety of the season, but they first you know learned about them from the coaching staff early in the season, and, and certainly they had it drilled into them once the playoffs began. And you know the, there's a debate, I guess, whether does it matter if the players know or not? Yeah, of course there, of course it matters. You don't want to be caught off guard in overtime with different rules, but also like you look at like all the different kind of scenarios that could happen. And one of them like sort of did like when the chiefs were driving, uh, when they had the ball, you know, second in overtime. And I think a lot of people at home were watching the game and they saw like the clock ticking down. Like the chiefs had first and goal from whatever it was, five, six, seven, whatever it was. The clock's ticking down like under 10 seconds. I think they didn't get the playoff until like, like right around five or six seconds left. And people are like, what are they going to, they only get to one run, like one play. <laughs> and then this game is going to be over. But no, it wasn't like that. So like if the clock had run out, then it would have just been another quarter. They would have flipped if, like, the field, right? <laughs> uh, I don't know if they would have flipped the field or not. They may have. I'm guessing but so. Probably. But if, uh, but it wouldn't have changed anything in terms of like, you know, like the chief's drive would right. have <clears throat> continued unaffected. Mm -hmm. You wonder if like, if the 49ers had the ball in that scenario and the clock was ticking, they saw the clock ticking down, would they have reacted differently on the, like would, would they have like run up and like spike the ball or something and like wasted it down? You wonder Possibly. like what might've happened That's a fair because, point. The, because the players didn't know what the overtime rules was. It's like, it's just unfathomable that Kyle Shanahan would go out of his way 
to strat and like his strategy was he wanted the ball quote unquote third if it came to that which all right like i think there's an argument for that either way personally i'd i'd do what the chiefs wanted to do had they won the toss which would have been to kick you know kick off and then you get the ball second and then you know you, basically the, the game is in your hands uh because if they score a touchdown then you score a touchdown you can go for two or if you want or if you they score three you go back and you know you might you might tie with the field goal or or you know go ahead with the touchdown or whatever. That's that's mm-hmm. the what the way I would have gone. But I think there's I think there's I think there's a, a reasonable debate on which you know which way to go. But there right. is no debate t- between like like he Kyle Shanahan did strategy like he put thought into how he wanted to you know handle the strategy of the different overtime rules but didn't bother to tell his players like what it was and also just what the rules were just Mind blowing that he wouldn't think that the players should know that the rules are different in overtime. It's crazy to me. Does seem crazy. I don't think it changes much in this specific situation. That doesn't mean again shouldn't they shouldn't have known. I agree with that. And especially you know the quarterback has to know because he's running the the, the you know the offense. But in any case, um, yeah. I to get into the more conversation and look, I'm not here to defend Kyle Shanahan. I don't want to do that because I enjoy bagging on him just like everyone else. <laughs> but I do think to your point, it's not like I think some people are a little too hard on like it's a no brainer that you uh definitely defer in overtime, double or yeah, and playoff overtime to make sure you get that second possession. In general, that's probably what I would lean towards personally, but mm-hmm. I think it's fair to say that. Well, the Chiefs had just given or had just gone on a long scoring drive right in the end of regulation. So maybe Kyle Shanahan is worried about his defense, you know, being tired or whatever. So I think that's a factor yep, in sure. there. And um, and I and I think you know, wanting the ball once it becomes sudden death potentially, yeah, that makes sense in theory. But the way you approached it from that point is wrong because I think at that point you have to know you're playing Patrick Mahomes and he's NFL Michael Myers. It's not like, oh, we stabbed him. He's dead. No, it's just like he just keeps on coming. That is inevitable. Right. It's just going to keep. You have to do <laughs> everything you dead. can. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, you made this point dead. plenty. Like you made this point before the Chiefs Eagles Super Bowl, where right. you have to be uber aggressive against a guy everything. like Patrick Mahomes. You put him away. Don't give him a chance to to come back and, and bite you. The example I always use is why the Bills uh, or why the overtime rules, new overtime rules exist. Because what happened to the Bills in the 13 seconds thing, I don't think, and sorry for saying this a billion times, but I stand by it. And I, I just, there's never been enough criticism for Sean McDermott not going for two in that situation. Because I know it's tough because if you miss it, you're only up two and now they get a field goal to win. But the difference there, and you have Josh Allen, by the way, the difference there, if you do get it and you get four, that's huge because they can't, they have right. to get a touchdown. Are they really going to get a touchdown in 13 seconds? Right. Probably not. Could they get a field goal? It's, it's unlikely, but it's possible. All it takes is one passing play down the field and there could be pass interference or something like yeah. that possibility isn't insane. Uh, and I, I just think that the 49ers had to approach it like we need eight here. We need to get eight because um, we're going to make this that because if you do, if you do get eight there, you guarantee yourself you get a third possession. Uh, assuming that the Chiefs, you know, go for it and get it. And if not, then obviously you win the game if they don't get the two-point conversion. So, yeah, I think that's the mistake. It's fourth and four. And I was shocked, to Kyle Shanahan's credit, he went for it earlier in the game on a fourth he down. Yeah, I could not believe that. I was like, oh, my. I thought the 49ers <laughs> were going to win the Super Bowl. So I'm like, oh, my gosh, Kyle Shanahan's actually going for it. He wants <laughs> right. to win the game. Right. And, uh, yeah, sure enough, he didn't ultimately in that fourth and four situation. And I get it, too. Like, okay, you missed that. Or... You don't convert the fourth and four. Uh, now the Chiefs just need a field goal to win. But like, man, I just what are you going to regret more? I think I just don't think you're going to regret not kicking a field goal. I think you're going to regret looking at it being like we didn't do everything we possibly could to beat Patrick Mahomes. And I just think that's a failure. And that's tying it into the Eagles. That's how Nick Sirianni should feel. The fact that you know he punted when he did last year. It's just, it's not good enough. It's was that situation pathetic. again? Was it fourth and two or fourth? And fourth three? and two from like the thirty. Two or 34, own. the Eagles yeah. 34. But, you know, the context there was that the Eagles had just allowed two 75-yard touchdowns. Right. They clearly just had no answer. Right. Uh, and they're putting the game in the hands of their injured punter who just came off IR <laughs> and wasn't right. good and was disastrous in the playoffs the year before yeah. and shouldn't have even been on the roster, clearly. And uh, Jonathan Gannon. Like, that's who you trusted more than Jalen Hurts, who was looking like amazing right. who was, who was, who was, who was the best player on the field that day. Right. So, like, I just... 
even when you look at it from that perspective, like people get wrapped up in you know, analytics. Of, it's not even just about the analytics. It's about like watching the game, yeah. seeing the flow of what's happening and like leaning into what does and does make sense. So, um, yeah, I mean, Shanahan clearly has it figured out when it comes to, you know, schematic advantage and whatnot. And, you know, the 49ers win a lot of games, but this game management stuff. And it kind of, I asked you this uh, in a chat that we have, like, like, who is good at managing the game? Because I don't think this was a good, for a large mm-hmm. part, this was not a good Andy Reid game either. It kind of reminded me, like, Andy Reid right. and Philly being frustrated, especially wanting the Chiefs to win this game. I was frustrated with him a lot of the game. Um, it kind of begs I mean, the question. At the like, end of regulation, when he had a chance to oh, run one oh more play gosh. with six seconds Thank left. Thank you, yeah. That's and I, what are you I, like, doing? I, I put it on Twitter, like, what are you doing? Like, you know what, field goal, yeah. you don't want to take one shot. I can't believe how many people argued with me on that, too. It's insane. I saw like, that. It's, I, it's a no-brainer. You gotta, it's you have Mahomes. A, okay, so it's not like you didn't have a timeout. Like, even if, yeah, even you have like, timeout. It's, it's a bad snap, you fall on it, you call a timeout. If you get pressure, throw it away. If you get like, Even if you get sacked, just call a timeout real quick. Like, right. It's, it's, and by the way, the play that they ran before took four seconds. So, like, like right. even if you run a, like a quick run slam the same over exact the middle. Play. Like, right, if you run a quick slam over the middle, guy gets tackled. Timeout. Like, it's, that's, that's right. not going to take two, uh, six seconds. So, yeah. like, it's, it's crazy to me that they didn't try to just win the Super Bowl right in that moment, right then and I there. I totally agree. Insane. Weird. I, I mean, and they I, won anyway, I so they ultimately lose. didn't. They're gonna lose. That, they, they, that's 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 the if the Chiefs lose the Super Bowl, that's yeah. the story. Like, why didn't you? Should have been. Why didn't you try to take one shot into the end zone? Yeah, agree. <laughs> I I thought that was crazy. I will say too. You just mentioned bad snap. <clears throat> I, it's pretty frustrating from an Eagles perspective that they did not get this version of the Chiefs. I mean, maybe they still lose, but like, <laughs> right? And I don't want to yeah. hear like, well, the 49ers have a great defense, or like, it wasn't just about that. And the 49ers yeah. defense, I think you can make the case better than yeah what the eagles defense was being in the super bowl last year of course yeah but it wasn't even about that like the chiefs were like you know mvs on that final drive is running backwards like taking a loss (laughs) and there was the play where uh mahomes tosses it to uh pacheco and it's like a terrible toss and there's like dropped snaps left and right like they were so sloppy and the Eagles didn't fumbled. get that. Yeah, that didn't happen Pacheco at fumbled. all. There was not a it single wasn't, It wasn't play. much of a hit either. Like, like CJ GJ decked Isaiah yeah. Pacheco right. in that game, and right. like, no, you know, no fumble. Fine. Meanwhile, like in this game, Diamador Lenore like barely touches the football and it yeah. barely pops out. So like, you know, right. like, so the Chiefs are like perfect in the second half. Like, like, yeah, the, the Eagles' defense is bad, but they were all, the Chiefs were also perfect in their right. execution. Yes, in that what I mean, half they're too. crisp. It just was, they're, it just not was a not single that break in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Uh, so that was frustrating to watch. It's like, where was the sloppiness <laughs> last year? Not even like one benefit, not even one mistake. So, especially, and again, wanting the Chiefs to win this year, I was like, they better not like be sloppy this year and lose after being so uh, pristine last year. Uh, yeah. So that was frustrating as well. Uh, anything else from the. Yeah. Team? I mean, there's t- so, many, so many different players like to touch on from the 49ers. Like, you know, Brock Purdy, that, that discourse is not going to end anytime soon. Like, there are people that were like, well, he proved he's not a game manager after that. He went toe to toe with Patrick. No, but Patrick Mahomes, he was fine. Like he was, he didn't play. Like he, he played, he played better than I thought playoffs. he would. Yeah, he, like he played better than he did against the Packers or the Lions in this game. He was fine. Like, he was fine in this game. But there are some plays left on the field, like the the that third down play before they kick the field goal in overtime. That was there, and you know the blame is being put on the offensive line for giving Chris Jones a free run at him, which certainly he had. And it's not easy to make a poised throw under pressure when you have that guy bearing down on you. So like, you know, please don't take this as, as like, you know, every quarterback should make every heroic throw ever, but that was there, man. Like Juwan Jennings was wide the hell open. So was Brandon Ayuk, by the way. Mm-hmm. And that ball, he just threw it out of bounds. Like at least give your guy a fighting chance to make a play on it. If he makes a better throw, that's a touchdown probably. So, I mean, he did not go toe to toe with Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> like he played fine, but you look at like the difference between the way that he played in this game. And just as an example, like, I'm not saying like, you know, like, you know, the, you know, the Eagles would have won a Super Bowl, whatever, 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 like, I'm not saying anything like, like that, but you look at like the way Purdy played this year and the way that Jalen Hurts played last year, it's no contest. Like oh. the, 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 there were totally different games played by those quarterbacks. Like Jalen Hurts, Hurts played way the best better game of any. If you like used all, I mean, Mahomes played it twice. Let's say like each per, perform or ranking each performance 
Hertz is the top performance of those four, right? Both yeah, I, would, I would say so, yeah. And I mean, even if you go back yeah. a year, for, like a year beyond that, like Matthew Stafford played his ass off in that game. Joe Burrow played well in that game. Like, yeah. Purdy didn't play like as well as any of the quarterbacks in like the last three years. Um, I'd say like the, you know, he was like on par with like a Jimmy Garoppolo, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's just kind of like what kind of quarterback he is. Like he's a, yep. he's a, an average middle quarterback, that, but yes, yeah. who had so much around him, uh, both offensively and defensively. And, you know, again, like he was fine. He was fine in this game, but he had to be great. And I just don't think that he was great in this game. And then like so many other players that are just like you know, Debo Samuel, just such a loathsome, <laughs> like hateable player. And he's got, you know, 11 targets, made three catches on 11 targets, 33 yards. Mm. And then there are like a bunch of other times where like they were, he was the first read. You could see like he was the first read and just was blanketed by mm. uh, Trent McDuffie. By the way, it's awesome. But like, that guy is one hell of a player just could not shake him. And so like beyond the 11 targets, there were other times where the ball was probably going to go his way and didn't because he couldn't get open and kind of messed up the play. And, you know, we touched on Purdy. Uh, Trent Williams looked kind of human in that game. I don't know if you saw the play where, um, oh man, I forget the uh, Chiefs interior defensive lineman just put him on his ass. Like it was Trent Williams on a down block and the Chiefs D tackle just kind of turned him and then boom. Mm. And then, uh, you know, you have Nick Bosa, got pressure, didn't have any sacks. Jake Moody, who they spent a third round pick on, like it actually had to hit a hit a long field goal, and you know, certainly kudos to him on that. But on the PAT, that would have put him up four at the end of regulation, you know, near mm -hmm. the end of regulation. Yeah, that the trajectory on that kick was way too low, got blocked, and only put him up three. That was a big deal. Like that point really, really, really mattered. Dre Greenlaw. I think it's like, it's not, I think, discussed enough how dirty a player he is. <laughs> like, last 41 games, he's got eight unnecessary roughness penalties, two ejections, he's been fined four times. He's not like Vontae's perfect level <laughs> dirty, but he's like one of the, the dirtiest players in the league. Thing. Probably the dirtiest player in the league. So, like, he's jogging out on the field, tears his Achilles. And, you know, don't root for injuries and blah, 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 blah. But, like, it's karma, man. <laughs> like, that was, well, if, there's one, yeah. if there's one player that's going to happen, that, that, that that's going to happen to in a game. Well, also, it's different. It's like, I think it's fair to parse that. This is not like he's, you know, doing his job and he's playing football and he, you know, did, something happened and he got hurt. He was trying to make right. a tackle or whatever. He was just kind of being out of control like he was earlier in the game after a certain play, like kind of like jumping around everywhere and <laughs> yes. acting kind of like an idiot, quite frankly. Yeah. And Jim Schwartz once said, if you do dumbass things, then, you know, eventually you're going to be labeled that way. And again, I'm not saying like I wanted that. I'm not like I wasn't rooting directly for that to happen. But like, I, I don't feel like, oh, it was a total accident. No, he was like acting kind of like an idiot. And sure enough, he did something that got himself hurt yeah christian mccaffrey uh averaged three three point six yards per carry he had a bad fumble that cost the niners points george kittle always like hi waving, we waving to the sky, to the cam. sky cam no waves to the sky cam in this game two catches four yards two for four for george kittle juan jennings by the way is like awesome like like what a great number three receiver that they have there uh yeah. he's a restricted free agent he'll probably be back with them next year you probably would have been the MVP if the 49ers won that MVP. game. All like the star players they have on that team, and that guy would have been the MVP. It's kind of crazy. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, a lot of players kind of like were, were you know, noteworthy. A lot of their noteworthy players were were sort of like, you know, big storylines in this game in terms of you know kind of not showing up. And, you know, first and foremost, again, man, Debo. And of course, Fletcher Cox <laughs> put on Twitter, <laughs> you know, like he's basically, you know, rubbing it in that he has a ring mm. and, and and Debo doesn't. And then he had a uh, EAD uh, in yeah. his Instagram uh -huh. story, which uh, I don't know. You can, you can search it that mean anything. urban dictionary if you'd like, but uh, we'll, we'll keep that off of here. <laughs> uh, so the last time the, I want to bring this up too. So now, you know, 
the 49ers, I still think they're going to be one of the top teams in the NFC next year, at least yeah. like on paper. They profile, they're not like going away entirely because they still have a lot of their core intact. Although, I will say, as we just saw with the Philadelphia Eagles, losing the Super Bowl yeah. takes a lot out of you. There's a, there's a real kind of drain to that. And specifically with the 49ers, guess when their worst season in recent history was? It was right after they lost yeah. the Super Bowl. They went 13 and 3 in 2019, made the Super Bowl, were up 10 points, as you mentioned, blew it. Next season, they're 6 and 10. Now there's injuries in there. But part of that, I think, is you, you might be a little bit more prone to getting hurt because you played so many snaps in the season prior. You know, you went an extra month plus into the playoffs and whatever so guys might be tired you're gonna have effects of injury like Dre greenlaw's injury now carries over yep. into the 2024 season so and the 49ers for as much as they're good i think and they have a lot of there that uh, they have some level of staying power like you said they won two playoff games where they're the worst team and they got breaks that they clearly did not get in the super bowl so that kind of evens out so uh, some of that stuff might not be going their way next season when Brock Purdy throws a pass and it should be an interception instead it's like a touchdown catch a couple plays later. Uh, so yeah, I think you know they still have reason to feel good about themselves and they can still be in the mix. But uh, you know this idea that they're merely just going to be back in this game. I mean, yeah, okay, good luck. They're returning. I think something like nineteen or twenty. Not returning, but they not like nineteen or twenty of their starters. Uh, are still under contract in 2024. So they should bring most of their, um, pretty much all of their core back. Mm -hmm. But also Christian McCaffrey, 417 touches this year, including the playoffs. Yep. 2022, he had 381 touches. So we were like, the, the, he's basically had like 800 touches the last two seasons. And it's actually kind of amazing that he had the year he had after having 381 touches a year ago, because he was, I mean, the numbers that he put up this year were, were I mean, like when you look at like the MVP candidates, the idea that like Brock Purdy was even one when he's clearly not even the most valuable player or close on his own team. Like Christian McCaffrey is way more valuable to that team than Brock Purdy is, in my opinion. Uh, but to go two consecutive seasons of basically 400 touches, man, I, that's asking a lot of that guy. If you're if you're going to put that kind of workload on him or anything close to that in 2024. He's a special player. I think if there's someone who could handle that, it might be him. But and eventually, you know, it's gonna it's gonna catch up at some point. I mean, Maybe there's been a lot season. of special running backs that have had those kinds of seasons where they had that kind of workload and they just weren't good anymore. Right. You're battling history again. Yeah. He might be the exception, and he's only he'll be 28 next season, so he's not you know at 30 quite yet. I think you know he still has juice in him. No pun intended there with the 49ers fullback. But uh, yeah, like you said it will at some point come for him and then all of a sudden uh that'll be not so great for them uh okay poor 49ers tough <laughs> jimmy let's take another like, break if you're like an eagles one one last quick thing if you're like an eagles fan and you know obviously the, the way the eagles season ended was his like just one of the worst collapses in nfl history but uh you know if you can get past what happened to the eagles season the way that the playoffs kind of unfolded Kind of like uh, you couldn't ask for like better scenarios <laughs> than the way it all kind of unfolded. If you're, a, you know, a, a, a rival hating Eagles fan with the Cowboys, just boom, one and done. Mm -hmm. And not only one and done, but just got their asses handed to them by the Packers in the wild card round. And then the 49ers, of course, won two games. It was probably frustrating for you to watch, you know, the Packers and Lions yeah. blow those games, but it all kind of paid off in the end when they just lost in such excruciating fashion. Right. It's kind of enjoyable if you're an Eagles fan and you, and you hate those particular teams. And if you really want to cope with it, you could say that, you know, the Chiefs winning another Super Bowl maybe takes this thing out of the Eagles losing from the standpoint of just like, well, like he's hard to beat. Mahomes is hard. To, like, there's only <laughs> right. so much you can do. There's only yeah. so much you can do. That's not to give like Jonathan Ginn or anyone off the hook, but at some level, it is just like it's Patrick Mahomes and it's tough. It's really hard. It's really challenging. Again, not impossible. And the, again, the Eagles could have done more worth criticizing certain things, but uh, it's really hard, is the point. Yeah, it's I mean, not easy. These it's last not two like Super Bowls, they played Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes. It's kind of like not fair. Yeah. And they've won one of them, <laughs> you know? Yep, that's true. Okay. <laughs> Uh, before we take a break, why don't you tell me about Kristen Roach of Roach Realtors? 
856-906-9295 is where you can call or text her. Spring is right around the corner. It's when a lot of people tend to put their house up for sale. So if you're looking, you're just kind of poking around, want to see what's out there, give her a call. If you are interested in just knowing like what your home might sell for, she can do a market analysis that's free of charge. It won't cost you anything. Uh, just, you know, in case you, you know, because there's a good chance, like if you bought your house in like the last five, 10 years, it is way more valuable now than it was when you bought it. So it's worth knowing, kind of uh, getting a, an idea of like what it'd be worth uh, on the open market. So again, call her 856 906 9295. Brandon. 95. So that's the phone number right there, right? That's it. Eight, eight, boom. 856 906 9295. I do not have her on my phone, as you can see, if you were wondering. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when I need a house, obviously, that's who I'm going to call. Okay. We will be back after this. Back here on BGN Radio. Just, you know, glossing over, I think, is the right way to say it because there's only so much to say about Eagles assistant coaching hires, and we don't know officially yet because the Eagles have not put out the probably all-at-one announcement that they'll do at some point here of who the new additions are. Um, did you have any thoughts, Jimmy, on the new additions? Because in addition to that, I also want to get on to some of the people who left. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, I was on vacation last week, so I kind of rounded them all up uh, when I got back. And it was I was actually playing catch. I actually called you, if you recall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I was do. like, uh, they hired this guy, this guy, this guy. And am I missing any? And uh, you helped me out with that. But yeah, the uh, quarterbacks coach, Doug Nussmeyer, I think some people kind of um, predicted that early on, yeah. like as soon as that they hired was like a foregone Moore, conclusion. Yeah. He was the quarterback's coach in Dallas when Kellen Moore was the offensive coordinator there. And then he followed Moore mm -hmm. to L.A. with the Chargers. And now he follows Moore again uh, to Philadelphia. I don't really have much to say about him. Um, I mean, he, he has, coached he, he has one a lot time of experience. Just, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's a lifer as a quarterback's coach. He was a fourth round pick, I think, uh, in the NFL back in the day. Um, didn't quite make it uh, in the NFL, but has experience like um, both the quarterbacks coach and offensive coordinator uh, in the CFL Canadian football league, uh, and, you know, a bunch of major college programs. And then with, I think, um, I think just the Cowboys and chargers uh, in the NFL. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. In the Rams uh, once upon a time before the Sam Bradford era. Right. But yeah, he's a guy that, uh, you know, he overlapped a little bit with uh, Jeff Stoutland in uh, at Alabama. Uh, just for one year, and they actually won the national championship uh, the one year that those two guys were there uh, mm -hmm. in 2012. So that's, you know, mildly interesting. Clint Hurt, I think we covered in the last podcast. I think they had already uh, reportedly hired him. I don't think we need to get to him again, but he's defensive line. On um, Nussmeyer, real quick, I'll say that I don't necessarily know that or think that there was an issue with uh, Brian Johnson and Alex Taney and their communication, but there did clearly seem to be some kind of disconnect at some level between Nick Sirianni and Brian Johnson and Jalen Hurts. So if you're trying to put optimistic spin on this, you're bringing in Kellen Moore and a guy who, you know, he's worked with before. Maybe that right. kind of is co more cohesive. I don't know. Yeah. Christian Parker, uh, role not known, but um, young guy, 32, probably going to be the, the defensive backs coach, which is of course an important, uh, an important coaching job for the Eagles, seeing as they were horrible in their defensive backfield uh, at points during the season last year, but coached um, uh, defensive backs in Denver the last three years. I don't know how much credit you give him for Patrick Sertan and for um, uh, their safety. Justin man. Simmons. Justin Simmons, man. I can't believe I couldn't remember his name. A couple all pro players. I think they'd probably be good under anyone, <laughs> but uh, you know, he, he of course uh, has sort of um, a, he, he coached for one year under Vic Fangio before Fangio mm -hmm. was fired as the Broncos uh, head coach. So there's some familiarity there. Bobby King, again, role not known, but probably maybe linebackers, um, mm -hmm. as in off-ball linebackers, that is. So uh, that was Tim McManus, McManus reported that, formerly with the you know Tennessee Titans. Um, interestingly... I don't know how much you make of this, but he coached Zach Cunningham at two different places. And yeah. Howie Roseman went out of his way 
like was not asked a question even he was asked like a question about the defensive defensive line line rotation and then he went off on a tangent on the on like you know they don't think they undervalue linebackers or they value them appropriately or whatever and they love nicobe dean and then he went out of his way to even bring zach cunningham into it and say zach cunningham had a great year blah 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 blah. it was like uh does that mean that you're rolling with nicobe dean and zach cunningham again in 2024 is like that is that the plan so you know i don't think you hire a coach because he coached one of players that may or may not be back at two different places but it is just kind of interesting that there is that overlap there so it's weird that it's two different teams you know it's not just like oh he coached <laughs> right. him at one spot he's literally coached him yeah the past whatever five four years yeah weird so i don't know we'll see and then joe casper um who coached safeties for uh the dolphins last year under fangio fangio brings him along with them uh, to once again coach safeties or the Eagles. So that's and what we have. And then outgoing, you can Philly. handle the outgoing guys. Yeah. He was Casper was in Philly too, before going to Miami. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, he was a quality control guy, I think. Right. Yeah. yeah so return for him. Um, yeah. I, on Justin Simmons, by the way, just real quick, I believe the Broncos can kind of cut or trade him to save a lot of cap space. So I just think okay. that's worth monitoring. I know he's a good player and I don't know if they want to get rid of him, but right. With the contract kind of like being like, okay, is he going to be there or not? I wonder if that might be a cap casualty and if they'll, if they want to get younger or if they have a different vision. I don't know, but I would, and also CJ DJ is a free agent and we know that Sean Payton loves <laughs> CJ DJ. So, you know, just something to keep an eye on with Justin Simmons. I think Vic Fangio certainly would love to have him uh, in Philly. And also is uh, like, there was the article I think from the, it was from the Inquirer. I forget who wrote it, but um, Justin Simmons had a lot of nice things to say about Vic Fangio. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Anyway, on the outgoing, we have it's it's just interesting to me that some of these guys, um, where they landed, like uh, Marcus Brady, offensive senior offensive consultant, ends up getting a passing game coordinator title with Jim Harbaugh on the Chargers. Mm-hmm. There, uh, more notably, you have Alex Taney, the former Eagles quarterback coach, now a pass game specialist kind of guy for Shane Steichen, and reuniting with him in Indy, and then Roy Istvan, who was the Eagles. Off, assistant offensive line coach thing dating back to like 2019 certainly it's been there a while yeah yeah pretty close um, to Stoutland as I understand it yeah I think well he used to play or yeah he used to play for Stoutland at one point and then they were on the coaching staff together uh so kind of a little interesting there that that would kind of not be intact because he didn't leave Cleveland for like a bigger role at least in title right yeah it was kind of a lateral move yeah so I don't I mean again I've said maybe just in, more money well, I've also deferred to. I think it's probably his contract was up. I'm guessing, as opposed to they mm-hmm. fired him. I don't know that for sure. I, you know, I have noted here. It's not like the run game was perfect last year, and it's not like you're going to fire Jeff Stoutland. But I wonder if that was kind of maybe something that was made for him to do. It's like, okay, you know, we're not going to fire you, obviously, but we kind of want a different kind of. I maybe someone new in here, some mm-hmm. new ideas, not just someone that you're attached to the hip with. So we'll see what they kind of do there. Um, is it TJ Pagnetti? Who's been like he's been an offensive assistant line coach in the past for the Eagles, or he's had. Was he had gone? That I didn't know that. No, I'm saying like maybe they'll promote oh, okay. him um, internally. <laughs> okay. We'll see. Uh, we'll I see. you're moving no. on to the next guy. <laughs> no. Now going on to the yeah, the departures also. Well, the most notable one, which I was saving for last year, is Brian Johnson, who will be mm-hmm. the Commanders. They haven't. I haven't seen an official title for him. I saw something about passing game specialist, but I wonder also if he might get the QB coach title there. Uh, obviously, Brian Johnson interviewed for multiple head coach jobs, multiple yeah. offensive coordinator jobs. I think, I mean, I don't, I love, I don't love other things about the commander staff, really. But I, I think it's inarguable. I think Brian it's a good move for them. Yeah, yeah, has done well as working with quarterbacks specifically. Again, going back to his college track record, which I've talked about before, and with Jalen Hurts. I mean, Jalen Hurts had a great season yeah. with him as his quarterbacks coach. So that and they're, they're taking a quarterback number two overall, or, so or I mean, you know, I, they move up or whatever. That, that they're maybe drafting Brian, a quarterback and that, that yes. like they need people, somebody to develop them. Right. And maybe Brian Johnson isn't a good offensive coordinator. There's evidence to suggest that for sure. But yep. I mean, I think there's also evidence to say he's a, a pretty good above average quarterbacks coach. And I, from an Eagles perspective, I kind of worry about the, uh, you know, the commanders getting a good quarterbacks coach out to pair with a good young quarterback. On uh TJ Paganetti. Uh, Back in the chip days, he's been there a long. That guy's been there a long time. In the chip days, the first training camp that they were having, you know, all the music that they had, 
like with all like now there's music during every practice, every, you know, every year, every day, whatever, like that's just common, but it wasn't when chip first got there. And I, I found out that he was the one that picked the music mm. and I wanted to interview him about the music choices. And they were like, no, <laughs> like, what, what, why not? <laughs> They're just like, no. I was like, really? I, I can't interview him about, about the music that he picks. And they were like, absolutely not. So was, that was always very weird to me that they wouldn't let me talk to him about mm. the music choices for practice, but whatever. Do you think it was, it wasn't just him not wanting to talk to you, right? They it could have, like, it could have been maybe just him. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe he's just like F that guy, but, but no, cause no. Him. Cause when I asked, they were just like immediately like, no, like they didn't okay. like go to him and, and right. ask him like, Hey, would, this guy wants to ask you about your music right. choices for practice. They, they were just immediately like, uh-uh, nope. Yeah, <laughs> that's silly. I mean, I get, I think the users are sensitive, obviously, to like non, they're sensitive about who talks to the media. Yeah. It's not like well, I've asked multiple times to talk to their equipment guy, too, uh -huh. like who, you know, gives out numbers and, you know, Rake. helmet styles. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, D. D. I, I don't want to butcher his last name. Greg D. Yeah. Greg D. I've asked uh, to talk to him a couple times, too, and they've, they've always shot that down. <laughs> Well, I mean, could be cool, Eagles. And also, you're not really giving away state secrets here. All right. You know, it's not like. Well, on whatever. that one, anyway. the, the re on that one, the response one time was, yeah, other other reporters in other cities have done that kind of story before. I'm like, so what? So <laughs> like, it hasn't been done here. I don't care. Like, what right. does that matter? <laughs> what are you? What are you? My editor now? <laughs> like, <laughs> what are you? Like, what are you deciding? Like, what 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 makes for good content? Like, I. Mm -hmm. I don't even, first of all, I never even read one of those before, but even like, mm -hmm. even if I, like, I probably wouldn't have the same kind of questions, whatever, like that somebody else did with it. Right. That's not a good, it's not a good reason. <laughs> I mean, you, could, you could do that with a lot of different things. Well, I mean, this person did, Kyle Shanahan spoke after the Super Bowl, so I guess, you know, another coach doesn't need to speak. That's a stretch. Anyway, you get the point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, Jimmy, any final thoughts for you here as we wrap up? Um... Hmm. I hadn't really given the final thoughts. Much the final thought. thought. But I'm going to have uh, uh, my Stay or Go series uh, over the next few weeks. We should probably yeah. do a Stay or Go podcast. We will. Um, yeah. So look for that coming up. Uh, and then mm. I just got back from Cabo, which uh, I recommend. It's, you know, I think yeah, like, you know how right. you hear that. You know how you hear the phrase all the time, like uh, uh, like when a team loses in the playoffs or like when a team is like three and 12 and they have like a game or two to go and they're like, oh, they just got their minds on Cabo. I've never been to Cabo. And now I see what people are talking about. When now you a understand team sees, why they have their it, minds on it. Yeah, right. Now I understand why people want to go there when their season is over. So I kind of get it. So yeah, I recommend Cabo if, you are, if you're thinking about going there. I know you're excited for the Brazil news. The Eagles are going to Brazil in yeah. one Friday night game. How do you like what? What's I know you're excited about that personally because you're yeah. going to be going well, to Brazil on the company dime. But how do you feel about that move for the Eagles and I guess the fans? Like, well, it screws them that? because it, they lose a home game, <laughs> like so. That's not great for them. Uh, and I guess there's I don't know if there's a, an advantage to playing the first game early, like on a Friday and. So out of a Sunday, like in theory, you get a couple extra mm -hmm. games rest for the for the week two game, but there's also yeah, a lot of travel. Rest that flight, so the, I don't know if there even is. The, I mean, the Eagles will have a nonstop flight, but I don't even know if they're even like commercially. I don't know if there is a nonstop from Philly to Sao Paulo, but if there is, it's like ten hours. So. And, and you know, if there is a layover, it's probably in like Charlotte or Atlanta or whatever, and then you can tack on. <laughs> excuse me um you know another at least three or four hours minimum with uh you know just the time spent in the airport and landing and taking off again or whatever it's like gonna be like a 14 hour flight and then from like door to door like leaving your house to the airport and then getting to your hotel once you land in sao paulo you're talking about it's like a 19 hour day mm -hmm. <laughs> traveling so somewhere in that ballpark so like once I started thinking more about that, I was like, oh, it doesn't mm. sound great. And then like shortly thereafter, another announcement came out that there's going to be a game in Madrid. 
in 2025. And I'm like, oh man, that sounds way better than Sao Paulo. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, wow. Sao Paulo is fine. I'm not going to shot at our many Brazilian <laughs> listeners. No, we do. I mean, I'm not even kidding. We, uh, I don't know if you noticed this. Like a lot of people on Twitter tagged us after that announcement. Yeah. We're like if you guys come down to Brazil, like, yeah. you know, well, drinks are on us. I, so you know, I would like to get there. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. Um, I would like to go. It would be, and I will say, uh, I get the, downside for people who want to go to an Eagles and are paying for an Eagles team in Philly losing that I get that I'm, I acknowledge that but if the Eagles were going to play in some international market I, just based on my anecdotal interactions like that on Twitter plus having looked at like web traffic numbers and podcast down numbers over the course of doing this for 11 years now there is a decent a lot size, of different Brazil like, yeah especially relative to other countries in Brazil yep. so I, I actually that, my, that was my first reaction when I saw the news. Other than having to write it up for bleedingyournation.com, my reaction from like th- th- for people was I was really happy for the people who uh, have interacted with us over the years on Twitter and like are just you know like just can't even believe it. Like people, I think Eagles fans who live in Brazil are just like their minds are blown that this is actually happening. So I'm I'm incredibly happy for those people because I think that's really awesome for them that they're going to be able to see a game uh, in their home country or or nearby or their home continent, depending where they're coming from. So I'm really, uh, I'm happy for them. That's my, like, that's my big take is I'm happy for those people. Yeah. I was wondering why it wasn't in Rio instead of Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo, like, and I looked it up. Sao Paulo's got like 12 million people. <laughs> so like it's a pretty humongous city. And then Rio has got like seven uh, million, but whatever. Uh, when, when the news first came out, I was like, boom, Nice going to Brazil, and I like I tweeted us so like basically like the equivalent of you know winning a trip on the Price is Right. I wasn't <laughs> thinking about going to Brazil or anything like that. I was just you know minding my own business. I had no yeah. like so like there were you know th- like a few Germany games, a couple uh, uh, you know London games, and no, the Eagles were going to be involved in any of them. So I had written off the possibility of you know, them going anywhere. I knew the Brazil game still existed, but I was pretty sure that it was going to be the Dolphins playing in that because, you know, the, like the NFL has like pairs teams with countries and mm-hmm. they're allowed to market to those countries. So for yeah. example, the Eagles have Australia, Ghana, and I think maybe New Zealand. I'm not sure. And the only team affiliated with Brazil is the Dolphins. And then if you look at like past Germany games and past, uh, England games. It's always teams that have like the, or it's more recently. It's it's been like the teams that have like the marketing connection with those countries, right? So there's there's you know historical precedent with that. So I was certain the Dolphins are going to be playing there, and the Eagles don't play the Dolphins in 2024. So I had written off any possibility the Eagles going anywhere, and then boom, Eagles playing in Brazil. <laughs> I'm like, yes, <laughs> holy crap, this is amazing. But yeah, but as far as the Eagles go. You know, not great for them to be losing to be losing a home game. And I also wonder, like, are the are the fans like that have season tickets? Like, I wonder if they're they're going to be screwed over in some way where they're paying extra, like they're paying the yeah, same amount for the I'm season sure. tickets that they normally would be, but but they get one fewer. I don't know how that's all going to work. People are going to be really mad. Like, you can get away with that after you know going to the Super Bowl or something like that. You can't get away with that after the season that they just had. So it'll be interesting to see how like all that kind of unfolds. Also interesting to see when their actual home opener will be like they're actually like, in Philly home yeah. opener, their Lincoln financial field home opener, because and cause, I don't know. It's just like, you know, normally it's what it's somewhere between week one and week three. It could be week three in theory, if you're playing two on the yeah. road to start the season, but also like what's the juice level for that? Could it be even, well, what it could be like in theory, it could be week four. Because they could play at home in week one and then have two right, straight road right. games. And at that point, like, what's their record? You know what I mean? It's like, what's the energy <laughs> yeah. like, for the home opener? Yeah. So it, that's definitely a little weird. Uh, who do you think they play? So here's are the, the Eagles' home opponents in 2024. I'm going to assume they're not playing in NFC. I'll, I'll say game. I'll say yes, so, no, or maybe for each one as you go through. We're just going to rule out the NFC East because that's probably yeah, yeah, yeah. not going to be Dallas, not going to be Washington, not going to be yeah. the Giants. So here are the so then six possible opponents um, that they would be playing, and I think one of these teams has another international game, so it's probably not going to be them. I think that's I forget who that is, but it's one of them. Uh, might be the Jags. Uh, let's start with the Jags. No, because I think you're right. I think they play in right. London every year. So yeah, it's probably not them. Uh, the Atlanta Falcons. I could see that. 
especially because like you just said you might be getting like the connecting flight from like that's one of the closer spots to brazil i would think yeah mm. uh carolina panthers uh i think they suck too bad mm. not that the falcons are good either but i don't know cleveland browns yeah i could absolutely see that sure Jim Schwartz team. versus Nick Sirianni. And... I mean, it's, just a, it's a team that went to the playoffs. So, mm-hmm. uh, Pittsburgh's, uh, Desha- how does the Sean Watson factor into that? It's like international <laughs> marketing. I don't know. Anyway, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. That seems like no to me. That seems like a no to me, too. I just, I don't know why, but I just feel like they want that Steelers game. Maybe Eagles, especially pushing to keep it in Philly. Right. Knowing that, you know, you get other people coming from Pittsburgh. I don't know. Packers. Um, yeah, maybe. And then you already said Jags. No. So the strongest ones, what's go on the record. I'm going to say they play the Falcons. I'm going to go Browns. Okay. Boom. We're on the record. All right. <clears throat> I guess that's kind of my final thought. Uh, other than <laughs> again, uh, there's a link to the bleeding your nation, YouTube channel in the episode description that you are, listening to this podcast on whatever podcast app. So make sure you check that out and subscribe so you can see the video episode. You can see me holding up the wrong crowd beer company orange seltzer can, which was delicious. 5%, by the way, on the alcohol on that. So like a little bit more than some of the, some of those uh, other seltzers are like four, four and a half. So Mm -hmm. a little bit stronger, which is, which is fun. Uh, Drink responsibly. Uh, Also check out the episode description for all of our sponsor information, including right to sell and craft jerky as well. Right to selling.com, discount code BGN15, and Kristen Roach of Roach Realtors. So uh, we appreciate you supporting them. We appreciate you tuning in. We'll be back within a week or so. Talk about more Eagle stuff going on. Uh, as Jimmy said, he has the Stay or Go series going on at phillyvoice.com. I also have my own series similar. I was, I think I frame it each year. I don't think, I know. I frame it each year as like what the Eagle should do at this position to kind of talk about Okay. Review and then the outlook for the next year. And then I add the poll. I add the poll, like I think you do too, mm-hmm. for the listeners to vote on. Then tabulate for each those player, do you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That. It's fun to have at the end of the year. I <laughs> I was thinking about like some of the, the lowest possible stays, like the most strong goes in recent uh-huh. history. And for some reason, the one that popped into my mind right away was Nicole Roby Coleman. Getting, <laughs> getting, like, the, <laughs> go, which understandable. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, that's been BGN Radio. This has been BGN Radio. We appreciate you rocking with us as always, and we will hold on. Talk hold on. To you. I, I'm pulling up 2022 now that we're on it. Okay, well, Jimmy <laughs> this, is doing that. There go results. Say, uh, you can follow us on social media on stuff too in the episode description. Our handles are there, and my work at bleedingyournation.com. Jimmy work, Kemsey's work at phillyvoice.com. Jimmy has the I went too far back. Results. I went, I went back two years. The bottom five were Aaron Sipas, mm. JJ Ortega Whiteside, Jannard Avery, Derek Barnett, Ryan Kerrigan. <laughs> nice. And they brought Sipas back and it cost them. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> right. here's a little this is an extremely in the weeds thing. I already know I closed the show. I don't know if you saw this. The Steelers cut, in addition to Mitch Trubisky, which doesn't matter for the sake of what I'm about to say, Presley Harvin. Who is their punter okay. that yeah. they kept over Braden Mann? So, right, nice little. Oops. As much <laughs> yeah. as I, I've criticized Howie in the past for, uh, you know, devaluing punter too much, kind of like the same conceptual thing I've said at linebacker, where like you have to meet a threshold. You can't ignore this to the point where it doesn't matter at all. You don't have to, you know, make it your identity, your focus, your priority, but you have to like address it more than not at all. Right. And, he certainly did a great job with Braided Man. That was a real like I think Braided Man was, it was really very good. Very good. Eight, eighth in punter EPA. Yeah. He, and like the eye test, like he just he was good. He was a very good if they if they have Braden Man instead of Aaron Sabas last year, maybe they win the Super Bowl. Like that would have been <laughs> maybe not, but like that would have certainly would have helped. It certainly would have given them a better chance. So right. anyway, uh shout out to Braden Man and shout out to Howie for getting the punter situation right and kind of getting one over ultimately on the Steelers. So boom. Okay, this is the end. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody.